Yeah, water level changes in uh, small lakes in Sweden. Uh, this method can be applied to uh, coastal areas as well, but here I only explained what we did in the small lakes in Sweden. Um, so uh, the research question I'm we are trying to answer in this ongoing project is how the water level is changing in the Swedish lake system, uh, which can be an input to hydrological modeling for validation, calibration, and so on and so forth. And it also can deliver information, hydrological responses of those lakes to climatic change and anthropogenic eff like effects. And, and finally, it can lead to uh, designing, imposing protection and preservation policies, uh, but uh, but measuring the water level changes in lakes is easier said than done. Uh, so here we are trying to see if the method, the new method of INSAR introduced in in this study, is capable of sort of estimating the water level change in those lakes or not. Uh, so, what are the available methods that we can estimate the water level change in, in lakes? The first one is like the very well known one is like the conventional methods. So, there are different gauges. For example, uh, I don't know, the very basic ones like those huge uh, uh, rulers that they installed in the lakes and they sort of measure manually the water level in the, in the lakes and the to the like very modern one like the pressure gauges, the ultrasonic gauges, but the problem with all of those, irrespective of the model, is that it's not easy to install them and to keep them working for a long period. You have to maintain those uh, every uh, very frequently, and especially if the lake is like in a remote area, it's not an easy work to do. And the other uh, method is satellite altimetry that works only in large lakes. And uh, for instance, there are only five lakes large enough in Sweden that can be detected uh, by satellite altimetry. How about drones? Expensive, hard to implement. There are a lot of preparation. And so I don't think that it's efficient to measure the water level change. And finally, the common INSAR method. There are existing INSAR methods but the problem with them that they sort of measure the water level, uh, the actually relative change in water level spatially, it means that the change in water level in one point is relative to the neighboring points. So to have an idea how difficult is like measuring the water level change uh, with conventional method, uh, imagine that there are 100,000 lakes in Sweden and there are only 40 lakes, 4-0, that they have like gauging stations. So, uh, if we look at this picture, what we measure in this study is, is the, uh, what the, for instance, at point X0, we measure uh, delta H0 after the time period delta T, and also we can measure the uh, water level change at point X1 after the uh, time period delta T, delta H1, but the common INSAR method that they exist now, they measure only the difference between these two, meaning delta H1 minus delta H0. So INSAR is an acronym for Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar, so how does it work? Uh, this, the microwave signal is transmitted by the, by the satellite. It hits the surface of the water, uh, but unfortunately it goes to the other direction because the surface of the water is so smooth, so uh, it acts like a mirror, so it goes to the other direction. But if we have something like, I don't know, high marshes or a tree trunk or something, it can be bounced back to the satellite. Uh, this is what we use here in Sweden, which has like the perfect uh, vegetation cover for this purpose. So what we do is sort of we measure the distance between the satellite and the surface of the water. And six days later, the satellite comes back to the same location and measures the distance between the satellite and the surface of the water. And we can estimate the difference between these two that the output, the product, is called an interferogram, which is the difference between the water level uh, in two times. 
so the process, I try to make it as simple as possible. We have, for instance, in this case, 42 successive images. So every six days, we measure the water level change. So we have 41 interferograms. We have 41 water level change between each uh, pair of images. And then we identify the objects that they have coherent behavior in all images to make sure that the, the received signals is not caused by artifacts or noises. And finally, we get a time series like this, and eventually we accumulate all of those changes uh, to get the time series of water level change. This is Sweden, as I mentioned earlier, there are less than 40 gauged lakes in Sweden, provided by Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute, SMHI, and there are five large lakes that their water level is detected by altimetry. Here I show the result, the time series of water level change derived from the INSAR on the left vertical axis, axis and, the, and from the SMHI on the right vertical axis. So for these four lakes, we can see that trends are fairly similar, similar, but the magnitudes are a bit different. And here we can see the scatter plot of that. So as we see, the correlation is, is very high. It means that the trends, the, the direction of the change is very well predicted by the INSAR, uh, not the magnitude though. Uh, this is uh, for the whole lakes in Sweden with the gauged uh, stations. So the bigger and the happier the faces, the higher the correlation, the correlation is. And uh, the correlation range is between 0 0.51 and uh, 0 0.98, which is fairly high. So with this method, uh, we can, uh, uh, this is not actually efficient method to estimate the water level change in day and night and in all meteorological conditions and uh, like very, very cheap. But the problem is that we can only estimate uh, the direction of the change, not the magnitude. Uh, so far, actually, we haven't been able to estimate the magnitude of the change. And if the water level changes uh, exceed the radar wavelength, then we are not able to detect the water level change. That's one of the other problems. Um, so, but the th good thing, the good news actually, is that in Sweden, the water level change doesn't have like peak magnitudes. So, and the vegetation cover is very, very suitable for applying this method. Uh, what we are doing now, actually, we have done some of these things so far, and we are looking forward to doing more, is like to identify the vegetation cover and also the lake characteristic and the objects with very high correlation. Then we probably would be able to model the, the, the magnitude of the water level change. And finally, we can estimate uh, both the magnitude and direction in ungauged lakes, which can sort of be very beneficial to understand the hydrological system of the whole Sweden. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you.